In this video, we are going to design, build, and test this box right here. Our challenge is to learn how to best optimize a thin box, the kind of box that you might put behind the seat of a pickup truck. I like to start by modeling the enclosure in WinISD. Here's what it looks like if you go with the manufacturer's recommended size, 1.25 cubic feet tuned to around 34 hertz. And when you do that, you get an F3 of around 33 hertz. The F3 is the point where the response is 3 dB below flat. Now, contrary to what a lot of people say on the internet, your subwoofer can play frequencies below the F3. It just can't play them very loud. You lose a lot of output when you get below the F3. So let's do some math to see what the box might look like. I'm going to make an angled enclosure. So we'll make the interior depth at the top around two inches and the interior depth at the bottom around five inches. If we make the interior height only about 12 inches, then the exterior width is going to be almost four and a half feet long. That is completely impractical. So now we need to adjust the height until we get something a little more reasonable. If we go with an interior height of about 18 and a half inches, we'll get an exterior height of 20. Now, I don't think it's reasonable to make this box much taller than that, but it's still a whole lot wider than I would like for it to be. So now I've got to make a hard decision. I can fix that by making the box a little bit smaller. And if I make the box smaller, I'm either gonna lose output or lose low end extension. Let's say I drop it down to about one cubic foot foot. Now the F3 is around 36 hertz. Anytime you design an enclosure, you're making compromises. The box has to fit in a vehicle, so I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice some low-end extension in exchange for the smaller enclosure. So I'm going to make the gross volume around 1.05 cubic feet to make up for the bracing, the driver displacement, the ports, and all the various things that are going to happen inside of the enclosure. That gives me a final width of about 29 and a half inches inches and a total height of 20 inches. For the ports, I'm going to use two inch ports because I just happen to have some two inch PVC on hand. According to WinISD, the ports need to be about 13.19 inches long. I'm going to round those up to around 13 and a quarter just because. Then from there, we take a look at two important things, the port airspeed velocity and the excursion. Now, because this particular driver only has eight millimeters of X-Max, there is a little bit of an excursion problem. We will definitely need to use an infrasonic filter to keep the cone under control at those lower frequencies. That's not something that is specific to this NVX driver. Thin subwoofers tend to have less cone excursion than regular sized subwoofers. All of this planning may look like overkill, but it'll make it a lot easier when we start cutting down the MDF and building the box. The simple act of drawing it in SketchUp just makes it easier to visualize the end goal, which is one of the many reasons why I joined Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning or wants to explore their creativity. Invest in yourself and your personal growth. If you have a specific skill you're trying to learn, Skillshare is the perfect place to start. From electronics and woodworking to 3D design, business space, and more, you can find classes that will match your goals and interests. I've been upping my game by learning how to use layout. That's a tool that's used for turning SketchUp designs into detailed plans. I've been watching the Create Interior Drawing Masterclass with Layout for SketchUp by Manish Paul Simon. The guy's an architect and is a whiz at SketchUp. So thank you to Skillshare for providing these awesome learning opportunities and for sponsoring this video, as well as offering my viewers a free month of Skillshare. So check the video description for a link. First 1,000 people to use the link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. All right, let's go make some sawdust. I was able to build this entire enclosure out of a three foot by four foot piece of MDF. The goal when breaking down material is to move the fence as little as possible. So I'm going to start by making a 29 and a half inch cut. Then I'm going to spin that piece around and make the cuts for the back, front, top, and bottom. This ensures that all of the pieces are exactly 29 and a half inches.
Now the front top and bottom are gonna be cut just a little bit oversized. More on why I did that in just a little bit. For the sides of the center brace, I grabbed some scrap pieces from a previous project and I set the fence to 19 and a half inches and then clamped a one inch block to the fence. I made this block by sandwiching two pieces of half inch MDF together to get exactly one inch of thickness. This allows me to create accurate and repeatable cross cuts using the miter gauge while using using the fence as a reference. All I've got to do is set my fence to one inch more than the length of the cut that I want to make. Now, if you try to do this with the wood against the fence and against the miter gauge, you're gonna get a kickback. After I did that, I ripped those three pieces a little bit oversized and I'll show you why I ripped them oversized right here in just a second. What I have to do now is mark out the angles I need for that angled slanted front. To do that, I'm gonna lay out the back, top, bottom, and sides all on the workbench. Then I'm gonna grab a ruler and make a mark at two and three quarters inches. That's two inches for the interior depth and three quarters of an inch to account for the thickness of the back of the enclosure. Now, looking back on the footage, I realized that I made a mistake. I made this mark on the outside edge of the top piece. I should have made that mark on the inside of the top piece. It's not gonna make that big of a difference in the final project or the final performance of the box. Then on the bottom, I do the exact same thing, only I make the mark at five and three quarters of an inch. We're gonna connect those two dots with a straight edge and just draw a line between those two points. <laughs> now the goal is to just cut along all the lines that I just made and I'll get a perfect fit every time. Now here's a, a little hack for you and one of the reasons why I think it's worth the time to draw up some plans or at least a very rough sketch in SketchUp. SketchUp has a protractor tool and with that protractor tool, I'm able to find out the angles that I need for the enclosure. Then I can use my digital angle gauge to dial in that exact angle on my table saw. Now it's just a matter of lining up the saw blade with the marks that I made on the edges of the top and bottom pieces and I get a perfect cut. For the sides and the brace, I'm gonna use a piece of scrap as a makeshift sled. I just grabbed some double-sided tape. I'll be sure and give you a link to the stuff I like to use down in the description. I cut one of the pieces to the exact shape that I want, and then I oversize the rest. I then tape them together and trim them on the router table so that I've got three exact copies. Now, while I've got them all taped together, I'm gonna go ahead and cut out the portholes in one of the sides and in the center brace. I'm gonna rough cut them with the jigsaw and then use a template to cut the hole to final size. Two inch PVC has an outside diameter of two and three eighths of an inch. Since I use a lot of PVC pipe for ports, I keep templates around for most of the common sizes. Now off camera, I cut a hole in the center of the brace and then I assemble everything except for the baffle. After assembling everything except for the baffle, I take the baffle and set it on the enclosure and line everything up nice and neat and make a couple of marks so I know where to cut my angles on the baffle. Then it's back over to the table saw, once again using the angle gauge to set the angle on the saw and I trim off the edges of the baffle so that I get a perfect fit. Now what I'm going to do is cut an oversized hole in the baffle and then use my router table to make a round over on the outside edge of the baffle and a rabbit on the inside edge of the baffle. My goal here is to cut a recess so the subwoofer can be sunk into the enclosure. So for the speaker cutout, I'm going to make that on a piece of scrap and then attach that piece of scrap to the back side of the baffle. If you caught my last video, you know that this subwoofer comes with a metal back plate that's designed to give you a little extra or clearance behind the magnet if you're making a really skinny enclosure. So one thing about this design is that I can put the subwoofer really anywhere that I want. I know that I can use that back plate to add some extra clearance so I can put the subwoofer on the left up above where the ports are, or I could put the subwoofer on the right, either high up on the enclosure or low down on the enclosure. How about a test fit? Now let's slather on some glue, slap on the baffle, and clean it all up with a flush trim bit and some sandpaper.
and we'll finish it off by rounding off all the edges. I'm gonna spray paint the port black and then I'm gonna paint the baffle recess blue just because I think the blue makes a nice contrast to the dark color of the carpet. To prep for carpet, I'm gonna tape off the interior baffle and the interior of the ports so I don't get a bunch of adhesive on those parts. In my excitement to get the box carpeted, I forgot that I need to make a hole for the terminal cup. Um, MBX sells terminal cups on their website. So if you're there looking to get one of these thin subwoofers or one of their good amplifiers or anything like that, make sure you use the code DIYAudio10 at checkout so that you can get a discount on all those parts you need for building a subwoofer enclosure. Now I picked up this carpet from Parts Express and Parts Express is another great spot to get materials and supplies as well as subwoofers. I'll make sure to give you a link down in the description to the carpet as well. I'm gonna glue the carpet on with some 3M Super 77. And while I'm doing that, I wanna take a second to say thank you to all of my patrons. If you would like to support DIY audio content, you can join these guys right here by supporting me over on Patreon. Check out the link way down in the video description. And I want to give an extra shout out to my $25 patrons, Bo, David, Doug, Dylan, Stereo Lab LLC, and Baba. Now this is the easy part of carpeting. The real trick with carpeting is to get the corners and everything on the edges to look good. Luckily the carpet stretches over the roundover on the baffle just fine. And I'm just going to tuck it into the rabbit that I cut earlier. That part turned out perfect. The corners are always more complicated. For the sides, I'm using some leftover adhesive batch black carpet from a previous project. This is also an MVX product, but it's been out of stock for a while. The adhesive works just as well as spray adhesive, and I thought the black sides would make for a nice contrast. Off camera, I grabbed some solder and some heat shrink and soldered on some wires to the terminal cup before I installed the terminal cup. The subwoofer here is a dual four ohm subwoofer. I'm gonna wire it to parallel to two ohms and wrap the wire with some cloth tape. I always drill pilot holes before I screw down the driver, especially when I'm using MDF. Every time I build a box, I like to hook up the DATS, that stands for Dayton Audio Test System, to see how close I get to my target tuning frequency. And as you can see, I got pretty close. But that doesn't tell you how it sounds. And to be honest, it kind of surprised me. I wasn't really expecting much since it's a shallow mount, single 10 inch subwoofer, but it sounded just fine for its intended purpose. No one's gonna shake the car next to them with a single 10 inch shallow mount. This kind of subwoofer is designed to give you a little something extra on the low end to round out your sound. And that's exactly what this subwoofer has done. The bass was tight, accurate, and clean, and there was no audible port noise. I could really feel the bass, but it didn't give me the same hard physical impact that you get with larger and more powerful subwoofers. And that's entirely to be expected. The real question is how does it compare to other thin subwoofers? I like it better than the kicker passive radiator enclosure that I tested earlier in the year because it's tuned lower. My recommendation is the same as my recommendations around that enclosure. If you have the air space, jump up to a pair of the 12 inch drivers so that you can get a whole lot more cone area plus that extra power handling. The key here is of course space. Even shallow subwoofers require the correct airspace. In fact, I've got an entire playlist explaining how that works. Click right here to check that out. I am Justin, also known as the DIY Audio Guy, and I will see you on the next adventure.